Crowman Manifesto. Hey, hey, World Warriors, I'm Brian Croman for a Croman Review, and welcome to Croman Manifesto. This special production marks six years of a Croman Review, and you know, just that, that's amazing, and hopefully that means many more to come. Thank you, everyone, for joining me on this journey so far. Whether you're here for the full-length production, or, or maybe you're just here from the reviews, I hope you enjoy everything that we have to offer this month. So, you know, let's, let's just get right into things. You guys remember last year's anniversary celebration? Indeed, Asuka Month served as a, a serious inspiration for this year's anniversary. For, for fan service February, for, for Chrome and Manifesto. I mean, I named this thing after that series of Gravure DVDs I reviewed last year. And while those reviews are absolutely some of my best work on the channel, I would, you know, I was still left feeling like I... Like, I hadn't really gotten a true Gravure experience. I mean, it's one thing seeing wrestlers try their hand at Gravure and being able to witness their efforts firsthand, but, like, I never had anything to really compare it to. I'd, I'd never seen Gravure before. So for this year, I thought I'd try something a little different to start. I thought I'd try and gain a little bit of insight and perspective by watching an actual Gravure DVD with an actual Gravure model. And I think I might have found the perfect starting point with another take on Catherine. So, Catherine is probably one of my favorite games of all time. It's an incredibly stylish, romantic, horror, panic puzzle game revolving around themes of love, relationships, and commitment with a hell of a story and a great friggin' cast of characters. The gameplay progresses at a nice pace, upping the complexity and difficulty well enough that you're not too overwhelmed by the time you reach the end, where they're just fucking throwing everything at you. New record, new record. Avoid being skewered. New record, new record. New record, new record steps. New record. You're the best. Oh, wow. Nothing's gonna ever keep you down. The cutscenes and voice acting are seriously top-notch, and this game was kind of my introduction to Atlas Games as a whole. It was an incredibly unique game at the time, and still kind of is. Just try and find a game like Catherine, and you'll mostly just get a list of cheap-looking dating sims.
fuck is this? Not to mention that start menu. Fuck, that's the best. So Studio Happy Chicken released another take on Catherine in the spring of 2012, just a year after the initial release of the game in Japan. Mind you, this isn't an official Atlas production. From Happy Chicken's Charlie Mime. Now, keep in mind, another take on Catherine has not been endorsed by Atlas, so we have gotten as close as we can to the source material without treading into dangerous legal territory. I, I don't know if that's what his voice actually sounds like, but it's legally different, which, which is the best kind of different, really. But yeah, another take on Catherine is a, it's a loose interpretation of the game, which I guess we'll get into more as we break it down scene by scene. Another take stars gravure model Coco. I, I couldn't actually find a whole lot about her other than she used to be a Pocky girl, which I, I imagine is like Japan's version of a, of a Fanta girl. So that's pretty cool, I, I, I guess. Anyways, after our opening credits, our first scene starts off with a bit of voiceover narration. Yeah, yeah, I knew her. Well... Actually, it was after I met Catherine, you know, those things happen. No, I'd, I'd say she was more like a cancer. No, no, what's the right word? Not. Parasite. Mm -hmm. Ah, but that makes her sound bad. Okay. And on to our first scene with Coco dressed as the game's title character, Catherine. Oh. Although dressed might not be the right word, it's more that Coco's wrapped in red ribbon. It's actually a pretty nice reference to one of the sexy pictures Catherine sends you in the game, so that's pretty cool. Right off the friggin' bat, though, we need to discuss something that's rather pervasive on this production. What the fuck is this filter? What is it? Why? It's... Okay, okay. I... You know... I get it. I think. I, I probably know why. I can, I can even kind of see where Happy Chicken was going here with, with, with their filter of choice. It's meant to look a little off. A little dreamy or, or like a memory. Maybe, maybe even a little pixelated because video games. But it's bad. It's, it's really bad. Like, just on its own, it's pretty shite, but when you combine it with other technical and editing problems, it just amplifies those problems. Like this scene, for instance. I got three words for ya. Con. Fucking. Trast. Yeah, that checks out. Con Manifesto had a scene with some really bad contrast, but that scene can't even touch this one because of that goddamn filter. And get fucking used to it because it's present for every single scene that filter every single <laughs> fucking kill me o okay but what about the scene itself what about coco because literally this entire review could be devoted pretty much to the filter use of another take so let's just let's just maybe give it a rest for now yeah, Co Coco's fine. She definitely exudes a sense of sexuality and confidence that was mostly lacking in my previous Gravure reviews. Besides being a cool reference to the source material, Coco wearing nothing but ribbon is pretty sexy, and, and she handles herself carefully enough that it's not an awkward mess of Coco trying not to spill out of the outfit anytime she moved. The music definitely lends credence to the dreamlike quality of the scene. I liked it. Between this and the opening sequence, the soundtrack of another take is definitely a plus. I also really like that brief point of view sequence near the end.
The only problem was shortly after that part, the music kind of faded out to, to silence. So you'd expect that the scene would be over too, right? Right? That's, that's what I would assume. I think that's what most people would assume, that once, once the music fades out, that, that the scene would fade out. Well, that's not what happened. The scene went on for like another minute and a half, like a whole 90 seconds of, of, of Coco still, still doing the sexy red ribbon scene in complete silence. No, no soundtrack, no like actual raw like audio from, from like the actual shoot, just, just silence, just awkward, awkward silence. Anyways, obligatory shower scene. Since there's no beach scene on this DVD, spoilers, we have to go with the go-to scene in a bathroom. And it's Coco taking a shower in a one-piece bathing suit. Again, the, the gravure trope of bathing with clothes on. I know I ranted about this before last year, but it's, it's never not gonna be weird to me, World Warriors. She, uh, she ditched the Catherine wig, which, uh, I mean, I guess. It, it'd probably get ruined in the shower anyways. I mean, it's not like it was an amazing wig to begin with, so... Sure. Whatever. God, that filter, though. Seriously. So, something that I noticed on another take, and it became especially clear during this scene specifically, but, like... Close-ups just don't fucking mean anything. Like, you guys remember the Kind of Manifesto DVDs? Those close-ups were all pretty pervy, focusing in on Asuka's time magic breasts or, or her ass, but you could at least always tell what the camera was focusing on. Compare that to another take where, like, the combination of zooming in too far, too close, the general blur of the production, and then that goddamn fucking filter, and it creates this perfect storm of, like, what the fuck am I even looking at? Like, here, try and decipher some of these screenshots for me. Yeah, hey, hi, how you doing? How'd you do? Did you get any of them right at all? Were you able to decipher a single one of those screenshots? Yeah, really? Oh, well, congratulations. You, you, you get to advance to the next scene. And um, if, you, if you didn't get any of them right, if you had no fucking idea what you were looking at, you, your punishment is that you have to watch the next scene. Shut up. start with the most obvious. Your production has kind of looked like shit so far because of your filter use. So instead of realizing this and backing off, you've you've you've, you've actually doubled down on it. But like again, within the context of of this scene, like I can appreciate that your filter use kind of makes sense. Like I, I get it. 
um, Coco forgot to shut off her, her camera after the Twitch stream of wind jammers that she was doing. And now we're just voyeuristically watching her in her room while she dances around in sexy outfits. But oh my god, it's a visual mess! That's not what a webcam feed looks like! Did Coco do the entire Windjammer stream like that? Couldn't someone have told her in the chat that her camera's like super busted? Also, I've just kind of accepted the fact that that Catherine wig is just lost forever. Coco wasn't wearing it in this scene and I, she's, she's not going to be wearing it in any other scene. It's, it's a shame because this scene could have been fine. Coco's dancing worked well enough for the scene and showcasing a variety of outfits, some kind of black and leopard print thing, sexy maid, sexy nurse. The music went along with the dancing pretty nicely. That there's, there's definitely one point where Coco's getting up off the bed though and, and she kind of stumbled for a brief second. Pretty sure that was kept in on purpose because they, they actually fit it with the music. Yeah, uh, nice enough scene. Okay, so this next scene, I don't actually think I can show you guys anything from this scene. So, um, in lieu of that, I'm just going to read you the notes that I took for this scene verbatim, so you can kind of get a clear idea of, of what was going on since I, I'm not going to show you anything from this scene. Okay, vibrator scene. The fuck am I doing? Why did I fucking do this? Is this even gravure anymore? Why did they film it from this perspective? Can I even put clips of this on YouTube? Tit fucking the vibrator. Okay, fingers in the underwear. I am not being teased anymore. I'm being masturbated at. <sighs> Fuck right off. You do not need to get on all fours. That's a close up I didn't need. Whoa. Okay, that vibrator got pretty low there. How long is this fucking scene? You know what? That bending over backwards part was pretty hot. I was so focused on what's going on that I didn't even write down yet that there's no audio. This fucking scene is silent, nothing, no music. The sound of the disc spinning sounds like a vibrator. I'm pretty sure I know what Coco's asshole looks like. Isn't like... A lot of the appeal of a masturbation scene, the audio. Hearing her breath change ever so slightly as she inches towards orgasm accompanied by a cacophony of lewd moans and proclamations of utter ecstasy. Not fucking silence. Oh my dog. And I underlined that several times because I literally wrote, oh my dog. That's what it actually says. Is this scene almost over? Pretty sure she just came cute freckle on her butt. Fine, whatever, I'll talk about this then. There's definitely another filter on this scene that like flattens the colors, giving it this vaguely painted kind of look. You can really see it in Coco's hair and face. Oh, it's over. 15 minutes. That scene was 15 fucking minutes. Fucking, fucking kill, kill me. me. So this last one here, I can barely count as a scene. It, it's a post-shower Coco dancing in a towel as filters and transitions accompany the music. Less of a scene and more of a music video almost. It, it's too short to really be anything. It really felt like another take just kind of ended with a... Oh yeah, and it, it's all a dream, so... Fucking kill me. 
And while that was the conclusion of the main feature, another take does have a bonus scene featuring Coco and a second girl, Moe Takahashi, taking turns filming one another on a bed. This was actually my favorite scene on the whole DVD. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that it just wasn't some blurry, filtered mess. Like it was just really simple, two girls on a bed doing some posing. No bullshit. Plus, Moe's pretty cute. She's got a really nice smile, cute poses. I like the quiet piano music. It shot nicely enough. It was good enough that I wouldn't mind seeing more of Moe, so that's probably the best first impression I could have. Then it's Coco's turn. You can really see the contrast between their modeling styles. While Moe goes for more of a cute style, Coco's all about sexy seductive. A lot of touching herself suggestively, grinding, arching the back. Yeah, again, this is the best scene of another take. And with all that said, there's only one thing left to do. Another take on Catherine. Final thoughts. <sighs> okay, so... Yeah. This is a really loose interpretation of Catherine. There's only one scene where Coco's actually dressed like the title character, and that's really the only vague reference the DVD makes. Love is over. Yeah, sure, that one too. I found the editing really distracting, and again, while I can kind of see the direction they were going for with some of these, I'd like to think there might have been a better way to go about doing it. And what about those multiple friggin' voids of silence this thing had? Coco seems like a good enough gravure model. She, she's definitely confident in the way she moves, whether striking poses or, or dancing, but sadly the filters and close-ups actually kind of make it difficult at times to appreciate how she looks. That said, and I almost kind of feel horrible for saying this, my favorite part of another take was the bonus scene, specifically Moe's part. I think it honestly just came down to personal preference there. Can't really help it there, I guess I just prefer cute over sexy. To conclude, another take was fucking awkward, but in a completely different way. With the Kana Manifesto DVDs, the awkwardness came from the model's inexperience and general scene direction. Another take's awkward came down to the editing and, and long gaps of silence and, and the vibrator scene. Yeah, that scene. Anyways, this has just been the beginning of Chroman Manifesto, so I hope you World Warriors have liked what you've seen so far and decide to stick around. It's gonna be a hell of a show. One hell of a show. During last year's Sadistic Tales review, Asuka was accompanied by Triple Tales partner Mio Shirai. And it, it was just the best. 
It was the most comfortable and fun Asuka appeared on camera for these Gravier DVDs, and Mia was a breath of fresh air to the series. Since that review, I was curious to see how Mia would do on her own, in her own Gravure feature. And that's exactly what we're looking at now. This is Aroha Kitsune. Which I have no idea what that means. I mean, obviously I know Kitsune. That, that, mean, that means fox, but because like you can... I mean, you can see Mio right on the cover of the DVD with, with the fox mask. Uh, licking the fox mask. But Aroha? Google told me it's like a really old Japanese poem, which, um, I will read to thee now. You know, for context of this Gravier DVD. So, uh. Although its scent still lingers on, the form of a flower has scattered away. For whom will the glory of this world remain unchanged? Arriving today at the yonder side of the deep mountains of evanescent existence, we shall never allow ourselves to drift away intoxicated in the world of shallow dreams. So yeah, make, make, make sure you're looking out for all that stuff as we go through Aroha Kitsune-like. Let's begin. First off, I just want to say how good this feels. Because Aroha Kitsune is made by the same people that made the Manifesto DVDs, I feel very much in my element right now. This certainly friggin' looks like an early 2010s story gravure DVD. Even got the JRPG music and everything. I'm thinking like a date scene. Yeah, d definitely taking one of your party mates out on a date. Anyways, Mio's in a robe by some rocks and water, and, and two things. One, just look at that friggin' scenery. Something that I actually missed during another take. Story Gravure DVDs, for all their faults, when they nail the scenery for their shoots, they friggin' nail it. Like, I want to go there, w wherever Mio is, right now. The second thing, eh, not so great. It's actually a problem that we're going to see pretty consistently on this DVD. It's, it's the contrasting. They crank that shit way up for a lot of these scenes, and it definitely doesn't help that a lot of these rely on sunlight for their lighting, so it's already pretty intense. And made even worse from the fact that a majority of Mio's outfits are white. When your skin blends seamlessly with your clothing, it might be time to fucking turn that shit down a little bit like. Otherwise, this was looking like a strong start for Hiroha Kitsune. Beautiful setting, Mio looks good in her robe. They have her walking over some rocks, and unlike in Kana Manifesto, they didn't put Mio in heels for that part. There's this really cute part where she's sitting on the rocks looking over her shoulder at the camera. Scene ends as she wades into the water, and we're on to the next. Again, beautiful friggin' setting as Mio walks through a garden in her underwear carrying an umbrella and a fox mask. She does the whole seductively chewing on a thing thing with the fox mask, not the umbrella. That, that'd be weird. Shut up! Eh? I mean, it's better than Asuka's ice play, so I'll, I'll give it that. Not really much happens beyond that. Uh, they, they take the shooting doors and Mio kind of lays on the floor for a little bit. Eh? Se seems fine. So this kind of slipped my mind for a moment here. If you, if you weren't here for last year's anniversary special and you, you probably probably haven't seen the sadistic tales review so like you probably have no idea who Mio Shirai even is or what these DVDs are but um Mio's a wrestler and you'll probably be surprised to find out that actually about half the runtime of Aroha Kitsune is devoted to wrestling matches it's a really weird combination that might actually seem pretty jarring at first. Especially when you consider that, in general, Japanese wrestling kind of tends to take itself a little bit more seriously than we do here in the States. 
So our first match is about Takuya Kido proposing marriage to Mio, and she responds to that by beating the infatuation out of him with a barbed wire wrap baseball bat. Like I was saying, very serious Japanese wrestling business. No, but in all seriousness, this is welcome. If we're going to have a DVD of wrestlers doing modeling shoots, then I appreciate having a match selection that doesn't take itself too seriously. I think that was actually kind of part of the problem with the Manifesto DVDs. The match selections varied in quality, but I can't think of a single one that actually, like, fit the tone of the gravure. Again, it's, it's really jarring to go from weird, awkward, cute modeling scenes to strong style, kick you in the face wrestling, and back over the course of 90 minutes. Iroha Kitsune at least tries to lighten that blow a little bit. It was a really fun match to watch, and it didn't overstay its welcome. Huh. Haven't I heard this song before? I think I might have. Anyways, Mio's in another robe, posing indoors. Again, bright sunlight, white robe, bad contrasting. Fuck. The only real noteworthy part of this scene here is, is that there's this part where she's trying to slip out of her robe a little bit to show off some shoulder, but, like, the robe is actually tied on too tightly and Mio kind of struggles with it for a few seconds. It's also during this scene here that I kind of started to realize that the cameraman's paying a lot of extra attention to Mio's legs in these scenes. That seems to be where a lot of the focus, especially on close-ups, tend to go. Granted, Mio does have a nice set of legs and all. I, I don't know, I guess after seeing five gravure DVDs and all of them getting pretty pervy around the breasts and ass, that this DVD giving its focus to Mio's legs is pretty refreshing, actually, so, you know, I'll take it. Our second match... Okay, look, I... I don't know who this other guy's supposed to be. Like, the website that I got the match listing off of lists him as... Tiger's Mask. But I don't know what that means, because that... Doesn't sound right. Like, he's definitely not like the Tiger Mask that I know, but he also doesn't look like... Any of the Black Tigers, so... Either way, matching the tone of the previous match... This is just a dumb comedy match between the two. The crowd are really into it, lots of laughs, great crowd interaction. It actually felt like they did more talking in this match than they actually did wrestling. The comedy was good enough that the language barrier wasn't too much of a roadblock. I could tell it was funny and why parts of it were funny, even though I don't understand Japanese. There were definitely obvious enough spots to make that clear. <laughs> And the match ends with a game of some rather violent rock, paper, scissors. So yeah, again, big thumbs up on the match choice here. This, this was great. So, in my notes, I literally called this scene another robe because it's another robe. Mio's wearing another robe. Can we, can we talk about the robes for a second? Like, uh, like have ourselves a little robe retrospective? Maybe a little title sequence?
Good evening. I'm Brian Robeman with the Robe Retrospective. In this scene, Mio's wearing a lovely white kimono style robe with a nice looking texture to it and all those cute little bug designs. Wonderful! I give it four Ric Flairs out of five. In this scene, Mio's wearing a lovely white and red robe that fits snug against the body to show off whatever curves one might possess. Smashing! I give it seven Ric Flairs out of ten. In this scene, Mio's wearing, you guessed it, Sunshine, a lovely white robe that simply glows in the sun's light. Incredible. Two and a half Ric Flairs out of three. And that was your robe retrospective. Stay tuned for more Chroman Manifesto, and remember, robe. Um, anyways, uh, where were we? Right. She takes off the robe in this scene to reveal some flowery underwear, which... Yeah, I'm, n I'm noticing that trend, too. I think so far all of Mio's underwear has been flowery, so... At least she's consistent. There's actually this weird part in the disrobing where, like, Mio's eyes are shooting in all kinds of different directions, like she's forgotten what the hell she's supposed to do next. Also, like, I don't think I mentioned this on the Sadistic Tales review, but Mio's hair is friggin' awesome. Just something as simple as her dyed side bangs from the top of her head, it's, it's a really unique look and it looks great. This scene was pretty good. I, I would have liked to see this one go on a little longer, honestly. Right away, this one was looking promising for the plain and simple fact that it didn't immediately appear to be a contrasty mess. The warm, yellow, orange tint was pretty cool looking, and a welcome change to the overly contrasty, natural sunlight scenes we've been getting so far. There was a really cute part where, when Mio's bra straps go down, she kind of shyly hid behind the umbrella there on the floor with her. After that, she does some more posing in the corner, and it ends with the most suggestive this DVD got. Mio strips off her top from behind the umbrella, and then just drapes it across the top to end. Which goes to show you how different these Story Gravure DVDs are from another take, which were far more overt about showcasing their sexuality. I don't, I don't know, just interesting seeing different takes on Gravure. So hey, remember those other wrestling matches on this DVD? How they were short and sweet and funny and generally fit within what you'd hope would be on a modeling DVD? Well, you can just fuck right off. Because this match with Toshi Uematsu is... Fuck. First, it's 30 minutes long, which right off the bat, that's about a third of your total run time. Just this one match. Second, I hate the ref. Their counting of pinfalls is bad. They, they do this thing where the first two seconds of their count are, are fine. One, two. But, but then, for some reason, on the three, they... In, instead of, like, sticking to the rhythm that they've already established, they add this dramatic delay to, to the three. It's one of those things you don't really ever notice as a wrestling fan until someone's doing it wrong. And this ref was doing it wrong. You have to keep the intervals the same. You, you either do your count one, 
two, three. Or, or if you want to add some drama to the match, like especially towards the end, you can slow the count a little bit. One, two, three. But you don't change your timing mid friggin count. Like, I can't tell you how many times during this match watching it, the whole 30 friggin minutes of it, that I thought it was over, but it, it wasn't because the ref's counting was just awful and off and didn't stick to any rhythm and it was bad. And it was especially gratuitous because this was a 30 minute match and actually even longer than that because there were definitely a couple edits to trim this thing down. The latter half of the match was just the same moves over and over and over again. Kick in the face, axe kick, small package, roll up, dragon suplex, figure four necklace, which I found out that that's actually Mio's finishing move, so that explains why her legs get so much attention on this DVD, because that's what she kills people with. And ugh, plenty of bad ref counts in between all that, and all that to end in a time limit draw. A time limit draw. For fuck's sake, you know what your Gravure DVD doesn't need? It doesn't need a 30 friggin minute time limit draw. Jesus Christ, what the f- why would you do that? Were you seriously that strapped to fill for time? You couldn't throw on a couple more extra minutes of each modeling scene or- or like, jeez. Like, what- what's the point? I'm- I'm friggin exhausted after watching that thing. I, thank God that the DVD's almost over at least, huh? Yeah, again. Thankfully, this is the last scene of Aroha Kitsune, and it looks exactly like what I need after watching that match. I could use a visit to the bathhouse. A chance to just relax in the water in a white see-through wrap of some sort. I, I can't tell what Mio's wearing. They seem to relax the contrast in this scene too, thankfully. This is this is pretty solid. A bit on the short side, but fine considering the monster of a match we just had to sit through before this one. I'm not sure I could handle a 5-10 to ten minute modeling scene. So let's finish up and finish off. Iroha Kitsune, final thoughts. I touched on this earlier very briefly, but comparing one studio's productions to another reveals a ton of differences between the various ways you can present gravure. While story DVDs tend to keep a pretty mellow tone and shoot at very picturesque or exotic locations, and rarely get into anything overtly sexual, Happy Chicken uses a lot more pop-sounding music and makes use of a lot more normal locations and very in-your-face with the sexual content. Of course, Happy Chicken's also sorely lacking in wrestling matches, so there's that too. And speaking of wrestling matches, yeah, the first two were a perfect fit for this DVD, but that last one, Christ, it was just exhausting to watch. Then there's Mio. She was a lot less awkward than I was expecting. At the same time, a lot of the concepts behind her scenes were pretty tame too. No newspaper bathtubs or light bondage here. That also reflected in the wardrobe too, where 90% of what she wore were robes and flowery underwear. It was consistent, if not a little... dull. Again, the contrasting didn't help a lot of these scenes. As for Mio herself, she did the good. Thumbs up. And that's Iroha Kitsune, so please, stick around as Chroman Manifesto continues. Thank <laughs> you.
So, five years ago, I reviewed a little wrestling game called Rumble Roses. I actually recommend that you go back and check out that review, but if not, here's the highlights. Konami! Friggin' mud wrestling matches! The leader of the Road Warriors. What? I've played every single one. And then they had the gall to forget the sexy cat girl. Shame. I don't know enough about sheep anatomy to subscribe to the YouTube channel and World Warriors. Fuck Rumble Roses. And you know, looking back on it, I think I was a little harsh. It's okay. I'm sorry too. But you have to understand, I was a completely different person back then, like. Just look at that boy. What do you think of it? Since 2013, I've come to appreciate dumb fan y bullshit and believe me, Rumble Roses is some dumb, fan y bullshit. And while I don't withdraw any of my previous criticisms either, I do feel like it's important to reiterate what made the game worth playing in the first place. While it doesn't play exactly the same, Rumble Roses is still built on the same engine as Smackdown Here Comes the Pain, a wrestling game that's frequently brought up when discussing the best wrestling games of all time. The vow system of giving yourself goals to complete in matches that ultimately impact your character's alignment to the point of transforming your character into a completely different gimmick with a whole new look, entrance, and moveset is, to this day, an incredibly unique and innovative system, and, yeah, story mode. And sure, the stories themselves were fucking stupid and really poorly voice acted, but at least they were entertaining. than my sheep. What'd you say about my shunter trap and fight? I will never get tired of that cutscene. Fuck it. Play, play it one more time. Cowgirl has teats more magnificent than my sheep. Teats, teats, magnificent teats. Of course. If you remember how that review ended, I said, There's a sequel. But hopefully I won't have to worry about that until next year. And, you know, um, a few years late, but, uh, hey, what are you gonna do? Rumble Roses XX Initiate! Do, do the thing. Rumble Roses XX was released in March of 2006, just a year and a few months after the first game and on a different console than the original game entirely. Not quite an Xbox 360 launch title, but close. Like I said earlier, over the years I've definitely grown to regard Rumble Roses in a slightly more positive light, so going into Rumble Roses XX I was actually feeling pretty good about it, I was feeling very optimistic. That said though, there were definitely a certain number of realities that I had to be willing to accept. The short turnaround time between releases, the move to an entirely different and brand new gen console. I mean, I'm no stranger to roster update 20 XX games, especially when it comes to wrestling. I was expecting the game to look just slightly better, maybe a couple new modes, new characters, new story mode, minor gameplay tweaks. I wasn't expecting the world from a year later Rumble Roses sequel. Boy, was I in for a hell rush of hurt. God, that, that move's not even humiliating. It's just mean. Ugh, let's just start with first impressions. I'll, I'll I'll walk you through it. Fuck, Aisha, what the hell? Winner, Aisha. 
so you go through introductions and, and loading, and you're treated with this screen here. New game or load game? Okay. Um, awkward start to a wrestling game. Normally, normally you just automatically load in whatever save data I might have. But eh, whatever. Ten-year-old game. So I start a new game, and then it drops me into character select, which... Again. What? I, I didn't even choose what I'm actually doing yet. Why do I need to... Why do I need to pick a character? So I figured, oh, okay, maybe... Maybe they're just gonna immediately drop me into a tutorial to, to like, show me how to play the game. So I, I pick my character, but then they just, um... They show me this map. Shit, like a shop, uh, Locales for me to compete in matches at, a... Place to view my unlockables... Option menu... Exhibitions, which I, I would have figured that's what my locations were, but that's that's a different thing entirely. Basically, the game just kind of drops you into like a career mode of sorts, without telling you that you're in a career mode or even what career mode is. So, career mode's basically just kind of the default mode of the game. You just kind of move around to all these various locales and compete in randomly generated matches. It, it actually took me like an hour and a half to even fucking realize this because just like... The UI of this game is just really messy. Other than a quick refresher on the controls, I really didn't need any help from the tutorial. Little did I know that I'd been getting help from the tutorial all along because the tutorial is just a compiled list of the loading screen tips. Okay, fine, I guess. I mean, sure, in the actual tutorial menu, they have these little video demonstrations, and, and they're mostly comprehensive. Mostly. But then you have tips like change in popularity and team chemistry, where the video demonstrations are just entrances. What does that even mean? How does watching entrances help me figure out how to increase or decrease my popularity depending on actions taken during the match? I get that the end result is a gimmick change, but the tutorial's supposed to teach me how. Especially since not every gimmick change in this game is determined by popularity. We'll get into that soon enough. Anyway, after taking the game for an initial spin for a couple hours, I shut it off to come back to another time. But when I tried to load up my save file the next day, Rumble Roses XX told me that I didn't have any save progress to load. And that's when I came to the grim discovery that this game needed to be manually saved. And that save option is, is buried in the locker room, then under the options, and then on the complete back end of your options, in the option menu. That's where you'll find the ability to save your game. It was my first time playing Rumble Roses. So, yeah, I wasn't gonna go fucking around in, like, the options menu. I was just playing around with the different modes and characters and just looking at things. So, forgive me for not diving into the options menu. You know, it's just two and a half hours of unlockables and progress and currency. Needless to say, my first impressions of Rumble Roses XX were not particularly great, but hey, you know, let's rewind a little bit. Character select. Hopefully you remember what the roster of the first Rumble Roses game looks like, and if not, that's okay, because the roster is the same. They didn't add a single goddamn character to Rumble Roses XX, not friggin' one. Okay, you know, you know, it's, you know, technically, it's fine. It's fine. Technically, I guess to kind of make up for the fact that they didn't add in a single character, 
all of the characters on the roster did get more gimmicks. It's actually what made the original Rumble Roses pretty unique. Gimmick changes for characters. Each character's doubled up on gimmicks now. On top of having a face and heel character, they now have super face and super heel variants when you max out your popularity. Again, they all come with unique looks, entrances, and movesets. Reiko goes from being an MMA-inspired character to more of an idol-type character. Evil Rose goes from having a BDSM demon look to literally transforming into a lizard woman. And Miss Spencer goes from being a history teacher to... Just, uh, just, just a wrestler, I guess. Look, they can't, they can't all be exciting. Um, either way, though, super variants, th those aren't the problem. Those are really easy to unlock. You just increase your popularity by, by winning matches. Super, super easy for super variants. No, it's, it's the base gimmicks that are a real pain in the ass to unlock. So you remember that character select screen from earlier that we looked at? You'll notice they actually separate the heel and face gimmicks, and essentially treat them as entirely separate characters. See, before you had the vow system to change your gimmick. Except there's no vow system in this game. There's, there's no vow system in Rumble Roses XX. The one shining gem of your franchise, the one thing that really made it unique and stand out from literally all other wrestling games ever, and you got rid of it. You got rid of the vow system. Fucking kill me. So what do you do now to unlock characters? Career mode, basically. Except career mode doesn't have any basic rhyme or reason to it. It, it. it has no structure. It's just a series of locations with randomly generated matches. You unlock characters by meeting very specific conditions in this randomly generated world. And that list of conditions reads as follows. 1. You have to win at least 15 matches. Okay, e easy enough. That, that does come with a bit of an asterisk next to it, though. You see, this game newly introduced multi-person matches. Triple threats, fatal four-ways, tag team, handicap. All very nice and welcome additions to the game that don't count towards your progress in career mode. You still gain money for winning, but winning these matches doesn't count towards your 15 required wins. Winning tag team matches will count towards your tag team progress, which unlock something else completely, and have their own set of requirements for you to meet. Anyways, number two. You have to beat all of the default characters at least once. Okay, that's only nine characters. That's not too bad. Except, remember, career mode is randomly generated, and doesn't keep track of your progress, so you better have some spreadsheets ready for which characters you fought and search out the ones you haven't and hope to friggin' god you meet them in a singles match. The last one's actually really simple. Three. Your three most recent matches have to all be wins. Then you're dropped into a championship match against the champion. Beat them and then you have to win another match against the now former champion's alter ego. Win that match and you finally unlock that character. I did maybe like 40 or 50 matches as, as Reiko, just bumbling my way through this career mode and playing in every single match they threw my way because I figure, hey, this they're giving me this match. This has to count as progress towards something, right? Until I finally resorted to looking up a guide online and finding out that's it's not the case. It's, it's not even, that's not the case at all. And... You have to do this for pretty much every character if you want to unlock everybody. Taking that into account alongside other features in Rumble Roses XX, like 
gaining currency to spend in the shop on costumes to customize your characters, or, or poses for them in the photo shoot mode, or, or punishments for the new Queen's Rules match, which replaces mud wrestling, thankfully. Queen's Rule match is basically just a match, beachside. Um, except the loser of a Queen's Rule match has to endure some kind of silly punishment, like dancing, or being pushed in the pool, or acting like a cat and having to make this noise. Or putting body lotion on the other woman. Or if you're Miss Spencer, just appearing on the friggin' Versus screen. Look at her! Why's she gotta be like that? She looks dead inside, like she regrets every life choice she's ever made that's led her to this moment. Fucking kill me! Just a quick aside on the graphics though. The original Rumble Roses might have been like a PlayStation 2 Marvel, but the move to the 360? Eh? There's definitely an improvement to the character models, but again, just... Eh? They look almost mannequin-esque, and that becomes especially obvious when, like, you see characters with backup dancers. That, that wasn't a mistake in the script, by the way, either. There, there are multiple characters in Rumble Roses that have backup dancers. They all look terrible. But hey, it, take a good look at Superface Reiko's Super Monster Face. Not know her MySpace angles. <sighs> Fuck, I'm old. Anyways, the the point that I'm trying to make here with Rumble Roses XX is this game's a grind. This game's a fucking grind. You have to grind for currency. You have to grind for characters. You have to grind for customization. You have to grind for costumes. You have to grind for everything. I know I said they added a few new match types, and that's cool, that helps soften the fatigue of grinding, but when half of those new match types don't even contribute to your progress towards unlockables, you just find yourself skipping them. Why waste five minutes in a fatal four-way that you might not even win because Candy Cane penned Menakage while you were stuck in one of these long-ass friggin' move animations? Fuck. Especially when you could just grind the fuck out in Street Fight where it's always one-on-one. -on -one. Street Fight's actually kind of cool. They, they, they basically just kind of like strip down Rumble Roses enough and turn it into a fighting game. A bad fighting game, but hey, a fighting game. KO an opponent by beating them until they lose their health. Best two out of three, they even change the UI so your meter and super counts at the bottom of the screen like most fighting games. Although it does introduce some goofy mechanics like juggling, which just look... Well, <laughs> you look. But yeah, no, no, grinding. Once I discovered that characters did not share most unlockables or money, I basically just started cheesing the game to get paid as quickly as possible. Turn down the difficulty, turn up the meter. What I'm about to show you now is basically the most reliably efficient way to just really grind out matches in this game using Miss Spencer. Roses on your marks. Fight! Atomic Drop City, bitch. 
just stun locking my opponents with non-stop infinite A drops and an H move to finish. I could end most matches inside of 45 seconds. I'm not proud of this, but the game left me no other choice. I mean, especially since there's no story mode, which I, I don't really have anything to say about that. Because there's no story mode. I would have to be pretty stupid to complain about a lack of story mode in Rumble Rose's XX. And yet, without the context of a story mode, you miss a lot. Like, other than a tiny comment Reiko occasionally makes on the Versus screen, Please wake up, dear sister. you wouldn't know her and Evil Rose are sisters, or that Anesthesia is the main villain of the series, or that Benakage, the ridiculous ninja with a giant frog, is basically an undercover cop, or that Rumble Roses itself is a tournament. And hey, we're missing Igle and Dixie talking about sheep tits. Magnificent tits! Whatever. Again, I'm not here to defend the rich lore of the friggin' Rumble Roses franchise, but some kind of story or, or cutscenes would really go a long way towards softening this friggin' grind of a game. To wind things down, yeah, customization. What you do in the game along with purchases from the shop mean you can play dress up with all the characters and adjust various perimeters like their bust or muscle mass, but the changes are so minimal it's not worth the focus. The costumes are painfully boring and few, and don't even compare to the outfits the characters are already wearing. Like, why strip away all the amazing costumes the characters have for, like, a plain schoolgirl outfit or a bikini? Even being able to unlock Metal Gear Solid costumes like that of Ava and Olga just aren't worth the grinding that you'd have to do. I spent far more time playing this game than I felt I needed to to properly review just to see if any of these unlockables or customization options were worth the time you'd need to put in, and they're not. For all the time I spent playing this game, I feel like I barely even scratched the surface. I even briefly played with the creative character, but again, because the customization options are so few, what's the friggin' point? There you have it. Rumble Roses, XX, final thoughts. Fucking kill me! No, seriously. Miss Spencer's dead-eyed face on the Player 2 side of the Versus screen on Queen's Rules matches summarizes my feelings on Rumble Roses XX perfectly. I'd just gotten to the point where I was able to accept Rumble Roses as a pretty good game with a big dumb personality, only to see the sequel strip all the charm away. Stories and character development were shelved for bad customization and dress-up, while innovative mechanics and progression like the Vow system were replaced with a nothing career mode grind fest. Even new match types didn't help because a majority of those matches don't actually contribute to your progress beyond currency. Once you realize what you're in for, the game becomes boring and repetitive and you're just looking for shortcuts to unlocks, hoping those Metal Gear Solid costumes are worth it. And they're... they're not. It's been over 10 years since this game came out, and there hasn't been a Rumble Roses since. For the best? Judging by this game? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's probably for the best. So, for Chroman Manifesto, I'm Brian Chroman, and
await your return, warrior.